it's really loud in here with the fans and everything, so if you have problems hearing us, just scream, throw things, whatever it takes to get our attention. We'll put the mics back inside our mouth and it'll all be good. Uh, we're going to talk about a lot of wireless stuff, uh, security stuff, some other kind of pontificating on philosophical type wireless things. My name is Bruce Paul. Excuse me? <laughs> My name is Bruce Pine, I'm with the Shmoo Group and uh, Nova Wireless. This is Adam Shand, he's with the Shmoo Group and with Personal Telco. And this is Zam, he's with the Shmoo Group and uh, Mesh Madison out of Madison, Wisconsin. New at DEF CON is always a good time to talk because you're kind of in between that sine wave where I was really drunk last night and now I'm sober and I haven't had time to get loaded yet. So what we're going to do is we're just going to pummel you with a bunch of information about wireless. We're going to go from layer 1 all the way up to layer 8 and talk about our ramifications of different state-of-the-art security. No RF, alright, so we're going to kind of start at layer 2, I apologize. Anyway, if you have questions, we're probably not going to have a lot of time afterwards, but we are going to have a breakout session in the bar, because the breakout room is full. So, if you want to talk afterwards, come to the bar and we'll, we'll have it out there. So, with uh, all due course, uh, I'll turn over to Zam. Good afternoon. Is it? Is it? No. Sorry. Okay, so, um, in working with wireless, one of the things that came to my attention initially when touching any devices that I had access to, they all sucked. Um, is who, who's deployed commercial IPs and open, maybe uh, open source versions of yet? Yeah. I see Matt in the front row. Thanks. Okay. Um, so when you have an access point up in a network, uh, a deploy being active in a network at some point, in some location, at some point you need to change configurations, get statistics from it, send data to it, otherwise it actually interact with the device. So when you do this, a lot of methods are available. Uh, most of them are TCP. Unencrypted protocols on top of that, Telnet, uh, HTTP, uh, maybe pushing a configuration through uh, FTP or maybe even TFTP if they're that back end. Um, so the interfaces available for most APs at this point generally don't let you actually communicate to the device in any secure manner. What's that mean to you? So if you have a large public network or even a large corporate network, if you trust your users, uh, that's good. But if you have users who are also in the network and are not trustable, this means that whenever you administer your AP, they can possibly see all your credentials flying back and forth. Um, that's an issue. Uh, the biggest point here is that, to my knowledge, no commercial access points yet. Yes? Okay. To the best of my knowledge, commercial access points that are available right now have no secure authentication mechanisms beyond maybe back-ending radius to a machine to say, yes, you are allowed to enter the AAP. Um, but in any, case, in, any, in any case, whatever data you pass to the AAP at this point is unencrypted and essentially just clear text. So that's a big issue to keep in mind when you're trying to actually deploy, say, a large citywide network or a mesh network. Uh, the APs you choose are going to be more or less defining how you get to them and uh, what kinds of things you just make assumptions of on the network. Uh, another bad thing about, of course, uh, commercial hardware is at some point the company that made it is going to not want to support it any longer. Uh, this has happened numerous times. I don't even have to start mentioning names. And at some point, you're going to want to keep using this gear. The cards aren't going to just die right away, but you're not going to be able to get firmware updates that fixing you know, lo looming issues if there are any that are out there. You're not going to be able to take advantage of, say, uh, people's uh, awareness of web vulnerabilities or maybe new ciphers that come out. Etc. There's issues with using anything that's integrated that comes in a box, that just works out of the box. Um, one last thing. Uh, whenever you want to actually get reasonable data about an access point, let's say you want to get a histogram of all the received frames that came in at 1 megabit, 5 megabits, 2 megabits, or 11 megabits. That data is not available in a lot of cases, but it's useful to have. Uh, also, our CSC errors, various things on the Air 211 Mac, you want to know, that you want to know some of this data uh, for various purposes. A lot of it might be pretty trivial and geeky, but the fact that you want to get to it is not going to be uh, supplied by most commercial vendors. Cisco and Lucent are the only ones that have a reasonable nib. Uh, Enterosys, a couple of other uh, hardware vendors that basically require you to toss a radio into a controller, uh, also have interesting nibs and decent data, but nothing truly as low level as uh, some of the solutions you know, and tools I'll talk about in a few minutes. Um, okay, the contrapositive to uh, closed source, as it were, APs, implemented with a variety of tools um, that are basically existing on Unix platforms at this point in time. There's only a couple of things that do access point mode on Windows. Uh, they're not open source. They're, they're basically created by one company, OEM, rebranded by people like Zoom. 
So uh, the issues at hand with open source APs are, are actually to your benefit. Uh, you can take advantage of well-maintained code bases uh, using drivers from Jean Mon and namely Host AP has opened the doors uh, to using access point code or put using making a device that's a Unix -esque OS OS uh, an access point, basically using Prism 2 cards, Prism 2.5 cards as an access point. Uh, this driver is an excellent implementation of the protocol, all of the management frames, uh, etc. It, basically, it's it's ideal. Um, kernels that they run on, uh, namely Linux, the BSD crowd recently got host AP support. Uh, I'm not sure exactly who committed it. Didn't follow it too closely. Uh, OpenBSD follows soon. I'm not aware of NetBSD's support yet. I'm expecting it to be out there eventually. Um, in any case, open, open source OSs are, I, I, from what I can tell, the only truly correct implementation or the only truly uh, the only platform I see right now that will eventually end up in a correct implementation of the protocol. Lots of vendors make lots of assumptions and or don't do product, adequate product testing before they release something. Uh, this has been the trend uh, over and over and over again. I don't see it changing. So there's a lot of good reasons, even in a corporate environment, maybe taking some extra time, creating an AP based on some OP100 hardware, maybe a 1U rack server that has a PCI slot, toss in a PCM CIA bridge, etc. These, these options are available to you. You can then at least have a device where you manage it securely using common tools to secure shell. Um, uh, maybe SCP to push configs to 20 or 30 access points at one time. Maintain the configurations in MySQL, writing scripts to read from that to push the configs, etc., etc. It's an open source platform. You do whatever the heck you want. Um, also, one thing that most vendors' uh, APs lack is, app, is, is good support for multiple and esoteric and weird protocols. On an open source implementation of, of host AP mode, you can at least have a full OS behind you to do things like, say, route on the same device, bridge other protocols on the same device, and or do all sorts of wacky tunneling on the same device. This is flexible. Uh, let's say you had ATM25 you wanted to drag across some 802.11a link. You could easily do this with cells and frames and also have routing happening side by side and near the problems would, 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 would exist. This would be a very powerful thing for you to have. Not that it would necessarily get used a lot, but the fact that it's there is generally worth considering. Um, open source tools available. Namely, Instant 802 started the whole ball rolling, at least from the press that I recall seeing. Uh, obviously, their address is right there. What they've done is basically combine 2.4.17 kernel compiled against microlib C libs and uh, essentially scaled down, stripped down to be small enough to fit on the one mega flash with BusyBox supplying some user land binaries. Um, it runs on end of life hardware. It's kind of cool, it's kind of geeky, but uh, as a basis, it's a great start. Masinki M1 and M2, these are two pieces of hardware that uh, I don't know if they're even available yet. They're available next week, and then when that. Oh, okay, vaporware, I'm sorry. So, um, what they amount to at this point is PowerPC, system on chip, small boards, integratable uh, into whatever you have. If you're a WISP, this might be an ideal thing for you. Uh, anyway, they can run, of course, Linux and use host AP mode uh, on a Prism 2 cards on a mini PCI slot. They're essentially a computer on a very, very tiny board with a reasonable amount of horsepower behind it. So seeing Air 2 a pushing hundreds of megabits on the thing is realizable. The, the open AP from Instant 2, that platform's a very embedded 4633. It doesn't quite have the guts to do anything beyond 802.11b, so you, you're kind of stuck with that hardware. Um, the uh, really available right now working very well solution is from, so uh, at this point, is from Socris. Uh, basically this board that I have on the table right here that I'll be talking and, and counseling into amounts to an embedded 4633, 133 uh, PC, PCI card bus controller. Yeah, card bus. I thought it was 16-bit, but uh, I'm not. So two slots for card bus interfaces, two Ethernet, serial console, a mini PCI slot for maybe a cryptography accelerator, et cetera. The, the possibilities are pretty open, uh, what you can do with this hardware. Maybe you want to do point-to-point sight -point, uh, tunneling uh, through the air at t several tens of megabits. It's possible. And what do you do? You buy the hardware and configure it yourself. You don't stick that out with a large vendor and, and deal with their uh, uh, policies and support issues and that sort of thing. Um, anyway, Fatport, the one of the last ones I want to mention, it has a distribution of software and you know, a specifically designed piece of hardware based on OpenBSD. You get it from them, they, they take care of all the back end for you as far as deploying an AP goes, getting DSL, that sort of thing. And uh, their hardware actually is securely managed by them, so when changes need to be made, it's coordinated. 
at any rate, that's an example of someone who's not using the truly lowly embedded systems that just cannot support higher layer protocols yeah, like SSH who don't have the functionality to support that kind of subsystem for authentication. Okay, so um, we have kind of race through what APs are out there, how you implement stuff. I'm not going to get into protocol specifics, but there's a lot of looming issues with, with various implementations of just basic things like how a station, a remote laptop roaming about, associates to an access point. So one of the issues that, I'll give some short background. Uh, most APs have a finite amount of memory in them. Well, obviously all of them do. Um, and <laughs> So when you have a device out in the, out in the open uh, roaming about, uh, what will uh, generally happen is as the card finds APs, hears beacons, emits probe requests, etc., cetera, um, it will then associate to an AP. But once that happens, the AP has to do a few things in terms of uh, house clean, housekeeping. It has to add an entry to a bridging table, usually to say, okay, if an affair arrives on the Ethernet interface or the wireless interface, I should then bridge it to another interface in my device. If there's more than one or two, you need to maintain this. Uh, so as an association occurs, that, that MAC address plus some extra, extra overhead is added to a table or an array or some sort of data structure in the access points uh, code base. So once this is done, you, you keep on increasing the overhead as you add a number of nodes. Usually it's linearly. Uh, I've noticed that OpenAP, at least as a driver for, for Unixes, uh, does scale linearly. The complexity of the data structure does not grow above and beyond the amount of associations you add. Uh, what's Sorry. So, he missed a meeting. Um, so, as you associate stations, you, you basically gobble memory. A lot of APs clip you at a, a set number of associations. Let's say the manufacturer expects or says in their marketing documentation, we need to support 64 stations or 128 stations. Some don't specify it really and essentially don't test the conditions of what would happen if you had 3,000 associations present. Um, so, in a lot of cases, APs can do unpredictable things when you try to associate many stations to them. A way to not have to buy 3,000 cards and have a lot of machines to host them in is to just change your MAC address in the card. Basically, this, the, the process to just create multiple associations on AP is pretty basic. But anyway, this, this more or less exercises a problem with most APs. All right, can we go to the next slide? Okay, so uh, what APs have issues with this stuff? Um, Cisco AP340 is after you associate 227 stations, stop sending UDP syslog for some unknown reason. After that, we have no way, when I, whenever I'm using these APs, to know how many associations are in the, in the thing at that point in time. But we know that as you keep on associating, after several, maybe eight to ten minutes, the thing will stop bridging frames, new associations can't be formed, and even if you uh, let all the associations time out to the point of UDP syslog returning to functionality, uh, you will not have proper bridging functionality. That is, new stations can come on, but the frames that they generate will never make it across to the Ethernet port. Uh, this is a looming issue. It's been so since 11.7. Uh, there's four or five support incidents available from the school I'm at, we supplied, and uh, they haven't done any activity on these issues yet. So if you are, say, operating a hotspot that has a web authentication portal behind the AP and someone doesn't enjoy your AP being there or has a vendetta uh, and wants to essentially DOS something, uh, why, why touch layer three? Just over-associate the thing and let it sit. Um, other issues with other vendors, uh, Atmel and Google SunTech are two sources of uh, basically real-time OSs plus some drivers for the embedded hardware platforms. And uh, they clip the associations at 64, but they don't time them out properly. They'll stay there forever. Uh, so as you fill them, uh, no new ones can form. So that's, that's another way to stop someone from getting the AP. Yes? I have not yet tested 1200s. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, he asked if I've had experience with Cisco to AP 1200s or the Enterosis R2. R2. I haven't touched either of those in person. I only read docs, and from what I can tell, they use the same uh, VxWorks code base. So I would suspect the same issues may still be there. Maybe they have more memory and it doesn't cause as much of an issue. I, I'm not exactly sure. All right, so next slide, please. Um, another issue with uh, just open 802.11 uh, associations allowed to an AP for whatever purpose it comes to mind in a situation where if you say uh, wanted to fix the over association issue by having only a certain set of MAC addresses that you will permit to associate, uh, if someone still wants to get in, they can still figure out easy ways to do this. One of the, one of the proposed ways would be to send a frame 
the destination uh, of a Mac of a broadcast from the source of the AP. You don't need to be associated. All you need to do is generate this, this frame, as a management frame. That would say uh, to all the nodes, deauthenticate, which would mean that they will then deauthenticate and re re revoke their association that they currently had to the AP. This means that anybody who's able to receive your frame that you surreptitiously transmit will then deauth from the AP and remain disassociated. Uh, XP tosses a little pop up. Maybe this would be annoying to see every, every couple of seconds. I'm not sure if people would notice this in a coffee shop. But um, in any case, if you had, a, say, a Mac access list, you could at least subvert that being there by knocking someone off and quickly taking over their parent source Mac address by simply changing your card's Mac address to become theirs, uh, thereby getting access at least to the association level and then being able to pass frames through the AP to some, some router or portal behind it. Next, frame. Next slide. And one last thing um, to keep in mind: we have basically, uh, essentially, uh, everyone. Uh, 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 go. What's the word? Uh, 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 go, uh, whatever. And we have a, a way to network that anybody can toss an AP up at any time and use the spectrum without permission. The uh, potential for someone impersonating your access points is very high. So a lot of solutions to try to get rid of this have keys per AP that clients expect, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But the, when you come down to it, deploying a wide network and managing that infrastructure, again, insecurely on most corporate APs doesn't seem too appealing to me. So if you were in a, a situation where you had, say, at DEF CON, uh, lots of APs with the SSID of DEF CON, and uh, obviously the MAC address is visible, or what would happen if someone put up an AP at the same SID and the same MAC and had more power than you? They would, would they tend to see clients associate to them? I would, I would reason that that would be the case. Um, what could they do then? They could more easily man the middle connection attempts. They could more transparently do uh, all sorts of interesting things on layer three and above. It's just one thing to keep in mind if you want to have an AP, or uh, if you want to say start a list and toss up APs, do bridging, do meshing around your town, and then have a portal behind that. Uh, there's no way for anybody to know that the AP they see is your AP. Put that in mind. And the next slide, I believe, breaks over to Bruce. And uh, questions we would prefer after all three of us. So here he is. All right. So we're kind of moving away from the protocol stack here. Sam covered the. Uh, low into layer two uh, LLC type stuff. So in general, when thinking about wireless or thinking about any kind of security, it, it, it's risk management, right? It's not black and white. It's not like it's secure or it's not. So you got to go out and design a system that tries to protect everybody given your threat model. The one thing about wireless is it's about the worst case threat model. There's no physical security to the data transport. Uh, maybe you can do some encryption to try and protect yourself. But by and large, uh, everybody's just out there hung out to dry. So what ends up happening is people spend a lot of time trying to secure the infrastructure and secure your access point and your network and all this other crap, and you leave your clients out there to dry. There's, you know, I have a vice president of marketing out in a wireless land running some old version of Windows and open shares and all kinds of nonsense, sending his traffic around. That's a great vector to come into a corporate network. Screw the access point. Go after the laptops connected to it. You'll have a lot better luck. So if you're on the side of dark, go after the clients. And if you're on the side of light, secure them. Um, another thing is there's a lot of money in this. There's an awful lot of money in wireless. There are companies running to make gear. There are companies running to try and provide service. And what that ends up happening is you get a product that's rushed to market. It's kind of like the dot-com thing all over again with all these harebrained ideas, people just trying to get something out to sell it. And a lot of times what ends up happening is reliability and, and security are compromised. For instance, uh, I've got an SMC 802.11a access point, bought it from CopUSA, took it home, SNMP walked it with, the, of course, public as a default string, and uh, it crashes, it reloads the box. If you can uh, hit SNMP on that box, it'll just reload it. There are many such instances where there are obvious reliability problems with the hardware, and the only excuse that I can even think of is that they were trying to get them to market too fast. So be aware of what you're buying. If you're buying for an enterprise, make sure you buy stuff that's time tested. And if you're looking to have some fun, go after the new stuff, because the new stuff's going to be where the problem is. I guess I'm getting a little feedback, so sorry about that. So what's the real risk? Um, it's kind of interesting. Everyone's kind of a doomsayer about wireless and wireless security and what, what, what really is uh, wrong with it. It's not that bad. Attacks are localized. From Las Vegas, I cannot attack the layer two infrastructure of a network in San Francisco. There's just no way. I have to be within earshot. I have to be able to see the network, and they have to be able to see me. So you're not going to just go out and do a global attack against all Wi-Fi networks. You're going to have to attack somebody local. 
and there are a ton of wireless networks. There's a war driving contest starting in half an hour. Uh, the meeting area starts now, so if you want to be in it, you got to go. Um, but it, they're going to find hundreds, if not thousands, of access points in Vegas. And some of them are going to be protected, some of them are going to be wide open, and there'll be a whole range in between. <laughs> People aren't going to go after the ones that are protected unless you're a target. If you, if you try and secure yourself, and you take due diligence to do something useful to keep people off your network, and you've got a casual war driver looking to go surf some porn or go hack some place in Norway, they're going to go 100 yards down the street and use somebody else. All right, so everybody talks about web, so we've got to have a slide on the web. Uh, web script are graphically flawed. There's papers on it. It was known about it this time last year. I'm not going to go into it. It's cryptographically flawed. It doesn't mean it's pointless. Okay, cryptographers love to talk in black and white. I have an algorithm that is yet to be determined uh, uh, weak in some way, and then suddenly there's a weakness that means, oh, we got to throw out the window, stop working on it, go go work on something else. Web is flawed, but it's not useless. Not only does it prevent a moderate technical barrier to getting on the network. The, if it's web encrypted, it's not like, oh, it's just web encrypted, and you wave your hand and you're on the network. You still have to collect gigabytes of packets and grind them to find the key. And on a home network, it's going to take a long time. And even on a lot of corporate networks, it's going to take a long time. And what's the real value? No one's going to come hack your house to get your one credit card and maybe like find out who you're having an affair with. People are going to go find a real target. So at your house, at small office, it's not that big of a deal. Also, this is kind of important. I think it was touched on for the folks that were in the Solaris uh, presentation before this. It is a do not disturb sign. It is a no trespassing sign that you're hanging on your door. You're all familiar that you, you really need to have banners on your telnet sessions and banners on SSH and all these things like unauthorized access, please, blah, 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 personal property, I'll come after you, and so will Guido. You, WEP is the, is the equivalent at layer two. You're hanging a sign in your network that says, hey, I don't want you here. If someone comes up to an unsecured, unwet protected network and they associate, they get a DHCP address and they're surfing the net, they can claim ignorance. There's a lot of things they can claim. They claim, I didn't know I wasn't supposed to be here. If someone comes up and spends you know, two days collecting packets, cracks weapon, gets on your network, that's a whole different deal. XP doesn't do that by default. You, know? you, you actually have to do something. So you may not be able to find the person on your network, but on the off chance he's dumb enough to be sitting in the parking lot and, and he's in his VW Beetle with a satellite dish on the roof aimed at your, uh, your building, <laughs> call the cops, and then you actually have legal recourse. All right. so. There's a lot of things you can do to secure the network. Uh, this is in the wrong order, so let's start here. Um, 802.1x. How many people here know what 802.1x is? Well, that's actually not bad. I think that was more than uh, Black Hat. Um, 802.1x is a port-based authentication mechanism that was originally designed for campus networks. Effectively, what happens is Campus has had, you know, I, I'm a campus network administrator. I got Cat5 all over the place. I got 5,000 ports lit up waiting for someone to plug in a cable to, to it just so I can give them a DHCP address and they go out on the internet. That's kind of a bad situation. Um, you could do things, of course, like, like maintain MAC address uh, lists and things that people allow on the network, but everybody can change their MAC address, and who wants to maintain 5,000 MAC addresses anyway? So the AOT.1X protocol was developed to allow you to come in and, and connect to a port and all, all the traffic that you send is uh, authentication traffic that goes to an authentication server. The authentication server verifies who you are and then responds back to the switch and says, all right, let this person go do whatever it is they want to do and open up the gates. So it, it's effectively a layer two portal that every, you can't do anything until you authenticate. So it's kind of a novel system. EAP is what they use to provide the authentication. EAP is like XML for authentication. It's very extensible. You can plug lots of crap into it. You can do MD5, you can do TLS, you can do all kinds of uh, one-time password authentication, whatever. And it, it, it's the, the switch, or in, in the wireless world, the access point becomes a pass-through for the EAP traffic. So I can use any EAP method I want, and I don't have to upgrade my access point. My client needs to know, and my authentication server needs to know what kind of authentication I'm running. But the access point just says, oh, it's EAP traffic. I'll keep pumping it through. So there's a protocol on, on the wireless side for EAP over LAN, EAP over wireless. And then what's usually happening then it's encapsulated in RADIUS on the, on the wired side going to the authentication server. And RADIUS gets you authentication, authorization, and auditing, right? AAA services. That's something that doesn't really exist right now in wireless. So what's really nice is after you authenticate, you can also send back arbitrary material back to the client, including, hey, web keys. So 
what ends up happening is every you know, hour you have to re-authenticate with 802.1x, and you can end up shipping a new web key to the client every hour in a TLS encrypted session. So while web may not be perfect, if you have a fast enough key rotation not to gather enough data be, to be of interest, suddenly your network's actually moderately secure. This is something that's being standard by, standardized by the 802.11i security task force. So in another year or so, they'll have all this and a couple other things kind of bundled together. But what's really important here is 802.1x and EAP were not designed for wireless. 802.1x was designed for a wired network. EAP was designed for PPP. They put them together, and there are a couple of issues uh, regarding the, basically how it works in the wireless threat model. It's a lot different than the campus threat model, right? Campus is you kind of assume this physical security. Right? There, there's nothing in wireless. So what ends up happening, when you leave the client out to dry, you still don't have authenticated uh, management frames. You can still cause them to disassociate. You can, you can still mess with them. There are man-in-the-middle attacks. There are session hijacking attacks that you can perform. Um, the, <laughs> It, it, it's, it, it's, I'm not going to get into it here, but effectively, if you're using web with 802.1x, you can actually uh, overcome a lot of the problems with 802.1x. It's very important. The Arbaugh paper that was released by the guys at the University of Maryland made one assumption. They stated it, but uh, it, nobody really caught on to it at the time, or at least it wasn't, you know, the press didn't catch on to it because it wasn't really sexy. If you're using web, a lot of the things, uh, a lot of the, uh, the problems with 802.1x are, are mitigated. The problem is you have to have a web key there before the 802.1x session starts. So you got a chicken and egg problem. When I want to use 802.1x, and I've got my XP laptop, which has X, uh, 1x support on it natively, I, I plug into a network, I associate first, and then I perform the 1x authentication. So then once the 1x authentication is performed, then I can get out of, onto the, the network as a whole. So what that ends up mean is, is you, during that time, if you're not doing uh, web authentication and encryption after that point, then 1x, all the 1x stuff is passed in the clear. The EAP traffic may be encrypted and, and great and wonderful, but the 1x protocol is still in the clear. So if you use web for that initial association, you, you, you can't see the 1x traffic, and it's great. But you still have a key management problem. I still need to get the key to the client. I still need a default key to give to everyone. So it's still a broken trust model in some senses that, hey, I'm going to trust you for mm, 25 packets, and then I'll make you change your key. And I'm going to trust everybody with the same key for the same 25 packets. Uh, it's a little dicey, but again, if you're doing this crap, just someone else is going to aim the antenna over here and just go over to Bally's and start using their network. All right, so there's other things you can do. You can do end-to-end -end encryption. You can do SSL. You can do SSH. Um, try to teach your mom to do uh, SSH tunneling. It doesn't work out very well. It's not a real feasible solution. It's great for geeks, but it doesn't really work out for, uh, for the populace as a whole. SSL is pretty handy, but uh, not all services can be secured using SSL, at least not easily. You can do IMAP, POP, SMTP, uh, web, and some other nonsense over SSL moderately easily with open source software, but anything beyond that gets kind of difficult. So the ultimate solution, use IPsec. If you can, use certificate-based IPsec. It's robust. It's very proven. That's something, you know, just like vendors, when their gear is new, you got a good chance of finding a problem with it because nobody's poked and prodded at it yet. IPsec is a fairly long-standing protocol without really any, problem, any major problems at all um, if you set it up correctly. <laughs> key. And if you are able to set it up, period, another key issue. <laughs> We, um, in DC, we ran a, uh, a tutorial, or kind of a day-long workshop on setting up VPNs. We have a, a group there called Security Geeks. We were trying to start ones all over the nation, so if you're interested in being a Security Geeks chapter, come see me afterwards. Sorry, done pimping. Um, we uh, had a VPN workshop and got everybody together. I mean, these were really smart guys. And we had, I don't know, 20 or 30 different machines. We had Linux FreeBSD. We had firmware devices, uh, Netgear, and, uh, or uh, net screens, and checkpoint boxes, and whatever, and tried to make them all play nice together. And it was a good, I think it was a good four hours before we had our first tunnel up on any of the boxes. These are people who do this kind of stuff professionally for a living. And once we got into a heterogeneous network, it took us about four hours to get stuff going. So uh, IPsec, it's great if you can get it to work, but good luck. Um, there's a lot of resources on the net. There's also a good website, vpn.shmoo.com, run by Tina Bird. It's got very good VPN information, and uh, I believe there's some actually VPN over wireless stuff linked from there. So, so what's the deal? I actually heard someone the other day tell someone, in all seriousness, 
don't bother turning on web, it's totally useless. That was the most asinine thing I'd heard in a while. It, it, there's, there's just no point in that. It, 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 we're smart people here, generally, or else we just really like drinking, but if you're here in this room, I assume that you're, you're moderately smart. Do some due diligence. Raise the bar a little bit and make someone just go down the road. You know, it, it, it's not that hard. There are a lot of protocols coming down the pipe that will be more secure and will make it more bulletproof and will make the cryptographers give a warm and fuzzy feeling that, yay, this is all good and you can poke at it all day and it's fine. But that's not the way it is today. So just do what you can and keep people off your network. And conversely, for all the people on the other side, don't waste your time on someone who knows what they're doing. Go find someone who's plugged in the Cox cable and then just advertising everything all over the place and just go use them. So anyway, that's the end of my slide. Um, I'm going to hand it over to Adam now and he's going to rant a lot. All right, can everybody hear me in the back? All right, so just to wrap up the security part of it, uh, there are some things you can do to secure wireless networks from an application point of view. Uh, you can run app open or active portals. These aren't so much security systems as they're splash systems. There's ways of announcing that there is a wireless access point there. Uh, you can run captive portals, sometimes called forced portals. These generally authenticate off an LDAP or a RADIUS. Uh, server of some sort, and again, they force you, they allow you to brand uh, an access point so people are forced to a web page, they can see your logo and all that stuff, and they allow uh, firewall rules to be dynamically updated. Uh, you can do authenticated DHCP, this is a problem because basically nobody implements it. Um, you can do application proxies if you want, again, it's a big hassle. And uh, a cool idea that I talked about last year a bit was extrusion detection or reverse intrusion detection. Uh, which is basically the idea of taking an IDS, flipping it around and watching for traffic leaving your network rather than coming into your network, and then setting up triggers to take action based on that. So if somebody connects to your access point and they're doing something that doesn't look right, you can dynamically block them. All right, so all the people sitting up here are part of what's being called the community wireless networking movement. So we've talked about all this security stuff, now what are we actually doing with it? Uh, community wireless is basically a grassroots effort to build citywide wireless networks. The idea being that you can sit down in Cafe 1 and get access across a wireless network to Cafe 2 on the other side of town, to your house, to your own internet connection, whatever you want. It's currently being done on an entirely volunteer basis. There's some nonprofits in the process being set up that people hope will encourage growth. Uh, it's basically people just screwing around and seeing what they can do with wireless. So all these groups started up a couple years ago, um, and they're slowly diverging in what their political and technical goals are doing. The first, is, the first group you have is the philanthropists, all right? They're basically the groups that are setting up hotspots. They're doing what the commercial providers are doing, only they're doing it for free. They're going into coffee shops saying, hey, if you buy an access point, we'll stick in a Linux box, we'll show you how to secure it, we'll maintain it for you, and you give bandwidth away for free. The groups like that are Personal Telco and NYC Wireless, okay? We then have the isolationists. These are groups that don't so much believe or care about internet, they're just building a wireless network. Uh, Seattle Wireless, Madison Mesh, these are all groups that are trying to do that. They're basically trying to build a parallel internet without the internet, right? So you can get, you can get access to the wireless net, you can cross the wireless net, but if you want internet access, you need to make your own arrangements for that somehow. Maybe you can VPN into a home server that's also on the wireless network or whatever. There's the anarchists. These are people who are starting community groups. Their, their main motivation seems to be to fuck the telcos, to piss people off, to make trouble. Uh, Consume uh, in London uh, is one of the big groups pro uh, proposing that. There's a lot of the no borders stuff involved. And I think most of the groups have a little bit of this in them. Okay, there's a new type of group coming up called the aggregator. And basically what they're trying to do is they're in rural, sort of highly populated, mostly rural areas that don't have broadband access now. And what they're doing is they're setting up local, community-owned wireless ISPs and providing the nonprofit infrastructure to link, provide peering agreements, and all that stuff. And then we have user groups, which are BayWug. They aren't actually building networks. They're mostly just helping other people do what they want to do and providing information and resources. So the good news is that most of these groups have similar end goals, right? The big dream for everybody is to build a wireless cloud, right? You want to be able to sit somewhere, you want to be able to get from point A to point B across the wireless network without paying a telco a monthly fee, all right? 
You want to do no cost peering. The idea is you put up an access point, you allow people through your access point without cost. Some people are talking about doing free internet as well. Some people think that's a bad idea. We're going to have to wait and see how that falls out. The bottom line with internet access is that it costs money somewhere. So how do you provide that for free? So this leads to the idea of a digital commons. This is something that Lawrence Lessig, he's a constitutional lawyer at Stanford, has been talking about a lot. The idea that if you have a, a free, low barrier to entry digital network, right, that it's a great platform for innovation. The internet was a digital common, but what's happened is that as it's become more, more important for commerce to happen over the internet, uh, the freedom and the anarchy that allowed the network to grow and allowed people to innovate on the network is slowly being taken away because what's most important is that bits can get from point A to point B reliably and that they can know who did it and catch fraud and all that sort of stuff. It's not so much that commerce is bad, just as that it, it doesn't work terribly well with anarchy. Um, so as far as the digital, digital commons, there's a lot of debate about all right, what exactly should be free, how does, it, how does it become sustainable, how do you make it work. The basic idea is the network itself should be free. You can run all the services you want over the network, right? You can do location-based services, you can sell web services, you can do mail services, you can do God knows what if you can think of it. That's the whole point is that people can innovate and find cool things to do with the wireless networks. But you should not be able to charge for the network itself, right? You now have the problem that you're building something for free. What do you do with the tragedy of the commons, right? You're deliberately building a commons. How do you make sure that it stays sustainable and it sticks around? Right? So the first thing is that it has to be decentralized and distributed. Right? You have to make sure that no one organization or no one person owns the whole thing. Everybody has to own their own little bit and look after their own little bit. The community groups should primarily just be coordinators helping everybody manage and interoperate with all the other groups. This is crucial, right? Not only does it allow a volunteer group to manage this because everybody's managing their own little bit, but it also makes it really hard for a commercial organization or a government or whatever else to co-opt, right? So long as there's no one person that can be taken over or no one company that can be bought or bribed or whatever else, it means that there's, there, there's, no, there's no centralized way to take the network down. So the network is free. Again, there's a lot of debate over exactly what should be free. Um, the network is open. Peering should be free. Again, some definition of free across the wireless network. Transit to the internet may be free. It may just be there may be philanthropists that do that for fun. And there may be other places where it's just not practical. Right? And then the other part is the actual network growth. There's a lot of research. There's a lot of interest in mesh networks. How do you make networks grow organically? How do you make computers talk to each other automatically and figure out that they're there, automatically route around damage, automatically route around people whose access points were in a crucial part of the network and they moved houses? How do you deal with that? And there's a lot of layer two, layer three, and even higher layer smart stuff. Problem is it's all being developed in universities right now. Most of it barely works in a lab and it's really, really crappy in the real world. So now, we, we build this digital commons, right? Th this is the end goal. How do we secure it? We don't have any physical security. It's wireless. We can't even control who has a cable and who can plug in. We have no control of the hardware. The hardware is commodity. As we grow, all of this only becomes harder. Not only do we have more and more and more stuff to manage, but there's more and more likely to be people trying to fuck it up, right? How do we control the growth, restrict, band, restrict abuse, allow it to grow and be useful without actually restricting the point of the network, which is allow free, allowing free exchange of information? This is a really, really, really hard problem, and nobody really has the answers right now. The kicker, though, is that if we don't solve it, right, if we don't figure out a way to do this, then the network itself will never reach critical mass, people will never start using it, and the services that we all want will never show up on the network, right? This is the final big kicker. We have to figure out a way to solve this problem, or all this wireless stuff is pointless, right? We're just gonna end up with commercial hotspot providers where you can open up your laptop in Starbucks and check your, ma check your mail, and really, who gives a shit, okay? So th this is what we need. This is like a call for help, a call for smart people. This is really, really hard problems. We need everybody out there that cares to try and figure out how to solve it, to play with the software, to work on it, figure out how we do this. So that's pretty much the end of my talk. Um, the slides will be up at www.shmoo.com slash DCX. There's the URLs for the people involved. Uh, huh? Okay. 
Um, we're also going to be in the bar afterwards if anybody wants to come talk to us. You want some time? Um, and then finally, we got an announcement here. Uh, the next talk is at 1 p.m. it looks like. It's Nicholas Fishback and he's doing router security. This is the wireless and routing room, so it's the talks all day. It should be about that. Thanks for coming. Um, I think Matt from Baywood wants to have a second to say something. <laughs> First off, uh, folks, let's give these guys a round of applause. This is great. This is great. Okay, so you guys heard a rumor that there's 200 milliwatt cards in the house. They are here. We're going to have it in the vendor area next to the Apache booth. We're going to be there in about 10 minutes. There's only 100 cards. Got to be there quick. They're 135. They're, they're Prism 2.5 cards, 200 milliwatts, straight from Taiwan. So if you're building uh, access points, so you want the ultimate war driving card, get them while they're hot. Later. These cards kick ass. Yeah.